One of Annette's plans is to buy about 40 acres someplace out in the desert. So we have about uh, 10 different properties we're going to look at. The first one we look at is by Chickahominy Reservoir. The property had a decent view of a few buttes, and it even had a couple old juniper fence posts still there that have probably been there for over a hundred years. The property's covered in real high sagebrush, about five foot deep, and the property didn't lose It is supposed to be real close to Chickahominy Reservoir. That's one of our favorite places to fish, but that's close as a crow flies. We found it was about six miles of this kind of bumpy, rocky road where you're bouncing over big boulders and going over a juniper-covered hilltop. We finally bounced and rattled our way over to Chickahominy Reservoir where we're checking out the fishing. And we talked to some people and they said the fishing is pretty slow, but the fish they're catching are real nice, between three and four pounds. But we have other property to look at, so we'll be moving on to see some more before the sun sets. A plume of dust follows it as we go on to see if we can find property number two. And these properties aren't easy to find either. So far, we've only found one of the properties that are deeply heading, hidden in the Oregon desert, but we found the round barn. So why not go there and check it out while we're over here? That's always worth stopping in. It's out the masonry, and Peter French never did anything halfway. He's even shipped in real mortar to hold the stonework, while most people just used mud. And the walls... In 72, 23-year-old Peter French set off from California, headed for southeastern Oregon, with about 1,200 head of cattle, 20 horses, several supply wagons, a cook, and half-dozen cow hands. He eventually settled in the Donner and Blitzen Valley. Here he established a ranching operation that grew over the next quarter century to 200,000 acres, making him one of Oregon's first cattle kings. At the time the round barn was built, French ran several thousand horses that had to be trained and exercised every day. Sheltered from the harsh winter weather, this round barn provided a place for French, French's vaqueros and buckaroos to ready the horses for rigorous work required of them during the busy ranching season. Of the three original round barns on the Pea Ranch, only this one remains. French's reign as Cattle King ended in December 1897 when he was shot and killed in a land dispute with a local homesteader. His legacy lives on and Peter French remains one of Harney County and Oregon's best known and most legendary figures. We only have a single weekend to explore all this country and look for that favorite 40 acres Annette's looking for. So we have to travel at night. That night while we were traveling down a jackrat, jackrabbit laden road, we had a flat tire. That is, it went flat during the night. So I'm going down and check out the hot springs at Heart Mountain where, where we're camped. A few mule deer does and fawns sneak away ahead of us as I head for the hot springs, there'll be time enough to fix the tire after the hot springs. First, I come to two steaming outside pools where the volcanic gases have heated the water and the water comes to the surface. And you can use them, they're pretty good. I got in and give it a try. You can see the volcanic gases percolating up and then there's a third pool and this one's in a structure that looks like an old homestead ruin but it's only been built for a few years and it has a nice pool that's deep as your head and it even has a steel ladder in it 
So by this time, Annette's up and around, and we're going in and check out this pool. And the water is just really nice. It doesn't even smell bad, and the water is just a perfect temperature. I guess I better soak pretty fast to fix. So we take a quick dip, and then we ha I have to fix this tire, and then we'll move on to look and see if we can find some of the property right down at the base of Heart Mountain. The tire patching job went fine, and we're soon underway getting ready to go down at the base of Heart Mountain and look at Annette's mosquito farm. There was a little better water year for this year, and so all these millions of lakes right at the foot of Heart Mountain have some water in them. There are a few that haven't completely recovered, but most of them are on the recovery process. So that's sure good to see there's some water down here. On a good water year, these lakes can be excellent crappie fishing with great big crappie and some catfish and even some trout in some of them. And they hold lots of waterfowl of a fall. This is one of the favorite migratory places for waterfowl. And of course, they raise a fair crop of mosquitoes. We drive down off of Heart Mountain, through Plush, and then to the end of Heart Lake, where we'll take a dirt road off and head for the back 40. We find the property on top a little hill with a lone juniper to mark the spot. We rattle down for miles down a dirt, a very badly rutted dirt road that could be totally impassable when it's wet. Past an old corral structure where there was once an old homestead, some poplar trees, and then on we find a which mark the spot where an old homestead once stood. And there's a lone juniper the rest of the property runs from this bench on completely to the hill here. But there's all these problems like road access. Part of it goes through private property, which could be shut off any time. And then the mosquito situation. There's so many mosquitoes here, if you open your mouth, 50 of them will probably fly in. Even though this is a very excellent property because it's right alongside the lake, there must be a little bit of private property next to it because there's an old wreck trailer. And we drive down next to the lake. This is what they call the Narrows. And this is an excellent spot for wildlife. Lots of ducks and geese and all other sorts of little birds love this marsh area and it's a good spot to find deer and bighorn sheep and large mule deer as we head back out we pause a moment and take a look at the old homestead structure with the old cattle corrals here where they probably at one time sorted and branded cattle when people lived here not too many years ago and then cattle along Heart Lake. Just a lot of good cattle. With the road access and the mosquito problem, probably we better continue looking for more property though. So we're going to continue on through Plush and get a little bit of gasoline and then we're corner of this property it's flowing a pretty good flow this year, but maybe doesn't always flow. Next, we go to the plush sunstone area and find a few of the Oregon State gemstones, the rare sunstones, which are polished up very nice. And then 
we have to head home. Everyone has to go to work the next day. So we'll go past some of the private sunscone claims where they've piled dirt high digging deep holes to get these precious little gemstones out of the ground as the sun dips low toward the horizon we'll steady a course right on home we'll first stop at annette's place at lapine and check that everything is okay and spend the night and then the next day we'll head for home we'll travel up through the desert and take a look at the sunsets which are totally second to none out across the open desert and then we'll get on 395 go down to Valley Falls and go right straight on up to Lapine which is only a little over two hours from here Plas past Albert Lake and on to Lapine after a night in Lapine which was very nice we decide to go on up and check out McKinsey Scenic Pass. First through Sisters and then up to the summit of the Cascades where the Civilian Conservation Corps has built a little observation station back during the Great Depression in the late 30s. We'll climb a little walkway which isn't far up to the little observation tower they've made. There are places where you openings you can look through and see the mountain tops in the far distance, all the snow caps, and then there are little holes you can peek through that tell you which snow cap you're looking at. The one we're looking at right now is Mount Washington. There are two levels to this observation platform. First, this little enclosed inner one, and then you just go out, walk up a few steps to the roof of this, and here's another one right up on top of the world. And there's a brass mountaintop locator right up on the very top of this. It's been worn by many a fingers, but it really gives you an idea of which mountain you're looking at. Some of the, la the lava, there have been some trees grow, and then they die and they're replaced by new ones. There's a little pup that looks like Samson up here, only he's much younger than Samson and he seems to be kind of a scaredy cat. We walk around and look at all the snow-capped peaks, climb up and take a look at the mountaintop locator right on top of the tower, and then we'll make the little trip down to the restroom and head on to the west slope of the Cascade Mountains. We'll stop on the way down and check the wild huckleberries out, but it's just a little bit too early for them this year. Some of them are starting to get ripe, but there's not a whole bunch of them ripe yet. As we peer back at the little observation tower on top this butte and head on toward home. On our way over through the Cascades, we stop just before we get in bed <coughs> and take a look at some teepees. And that's kind of thinking about a teepee for the property. And they're supposed to be really comfortable. They're supposed to be warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And you just build a fire right in the center of them and the smoke goes right out the little smoke vent on top. A little snow is snowed in the fire pit as we look at the teepee, but all the rain and snow seems to fall directly in the fire pit. So that's pretty good, and the teepee furniture 
is really easy to fix up and it was just cozy and nice and it would look really good out in the desert. There's a nice flap for the door that keeps that old cold desert wind from going in and chilling you to the bone. It is very early spring of 2012 and we have leads on two more pieces of property. So we're going to head to Southeast Oregon and take a look at some of these properties if we can find them. All the lakes down here are fairly well filled with water. It's been a good water year again and we see lots of waterfowl on them including some very nice swans on some of the lakes right alongside the highway as we move south. It got dark on us before we got to look at the first property we were going to look at but we think we found it in the dark anyway and it didn't look too good. So we headed on over to Whitehorse Hot Springs to spend the night. We spent the night in our new sleeping bags and the next morning we were up early and heading for Coyote Lake to take a look at the property. Uh, the hot springs were nice and warm and we're on our way to Coyote Lake. We spent the night at Willow Creek Hot Springs the next morning when the sun was just beginning to come over the tops of the hills. We're in the vehicle and heading out to find one of the properties out around Coyote Lake. We moved down the little lane out of White Horse Hot Springs out on White Horse Ranch Road and then past the White Horse Ranch itself. We see they even have a couple teepees up. We stop and take a look at this huge ranch and see some quail out front. This ranch runs their cattle over one and one half million acres. It was established in the 1880s by a guy named Henry Miller. We see their sign over their gate post and their brand above the gate as we head on east. As people become more discouraged with the desert type ranching, they, they bought up many of the homesteads around, but there's still a few that they never did buy up, and so we're going out and take a look at one. It's 160 acres, and it's out in the desert in a low area called Coyote Lake. We stop a few times to get our bearing before going on and the Steens Mountains are covered with snow and standing tall in the background. We reach the property and we're very pleasantly surprised by it. An old cow just had a calf on the property. One of our landmarks was Twin Buttes and we found Twin Buttes out here. So we'll keep going on till we think we found the property. And this looks like the way the property was described. It's a grassy meadow out in the middle of a sea of sagebrush. We get out and look around. This must be the 160 acres. And the grass is growing tall and it's a real nice sandy loam soil. From there, we go on out to this dry lake bed called Coyote Lake. Annette's going to bring the car down on the lake itself and pick me up. The lake shines in the almost midday sunlight by now as we move the vehicle out on this playa. The playa is dry and hard even have trouble driving a nail into it, it's so hard. Annette 
has been driving on some kind of rough roads, so have had to go real slow on the gravel roads, or else you'll get a flat tire. But out here, she can really go, as this is really smooth, and it's just a gentle humming of the crack surfaces of Playa as she buzzes past. Very few people know about Coyote Lake, and fewer of them have ever been here. It's just a secluded bit of desert. From there, we move up to the first well, which is just beyond Coyote Lake, and there's the solar panels above making electricity to run the water pump that's pumping the water from electric submersible pumps into this big tank and Marge is going to water right with an old cow. The two of them seem to be getting along pretty good together although they each have their own individual technique for watering. I asked Annette and Marge if they needed a bath they could probably even take a bath in the water tank but they both said they were perfectly clean. Pretty cold. I Pretty mean, cold. Not, like really cold, but it's Oh yeah, it's cold. I mean it's quite cold. It's colder than what comes out of the faucet. That cow thinks it's plenty cold. That's good water. From the well, we move on a little farther on a graded dirt and gravel road. We found a survey monument that we stopped and looked at. From the surveyor's monument, we move on up to a line sh shack for cattle tending. This is part of the Albert Ranch, and they have thousands of head of cattle over millions of acres, and so they have to keep these cattle moving all the time. It takes 40 acres to feed one cow. We move on up to an artesian well where the water is freely flowing right out of the ground and it's a good flow too and then it's running out in its own little creek. The water, water again is rather warm coming out of the artesian well. We are almost to Mickey Playa and Mickey Butte is real close by in the there's just an excellent example of the receding water line as the Great Basin slowly dried up there's some places where the water remained at one level for a considerable time there's a real deep ledge going right around this hill which was made by the wave action of the water of the Great Basin from there we move to Mickey Hot Springs that's the Yellowstone of the Oregon Desert. As we start into Mickey Hot Springs, we see a group of quail scurrying to make their clean getaway out through the sagebrush. The steam is billowing skyward as we come to the first bit of the hot springs. This is a big glory hole then you can look way down in it and see almost to the center of the earth. And this water is very near boiling, so it's super hot. But then it cools and runs out a little ditch. And it's just big enough for a few people to bathe in. About the only place here where you could bathe, and then only on cold days. The steam is boiling out of some spots down below. We go down and find some of what were one time bubbling mud pots and just a little steam is venting from them now. Some of these vents seem to just dry up. I guess maybe they get plugged and go on to another spot. There's one that used to be a really neat bubbling mud pot but the mud's pretty well dried up and the steam coming from below has made some little steam whistles. You can see the little pipe sticking up from where these steam whistles are. And they're still venting a little bit of steam 
even though the mud is drying, there's a really nice little steam whistle and another one. This is the bug cooker. That boiling water comes up and stirs up a little mud and it always cooks a bunch of bugs. Steam's escaping there. This one's doing some good boiling. That one's doing its share of boiling. This one was doing a lot of hissing and spurting steam, and it almost like acted like it was trying to erupt. So I steered a little bit clear of that. I was afraid it might erupt, and some of that bubbling steam might, boiling steam might scald you. Then there's a spot where the scalding hot water comes right out of the earth, and it's made little pathways through here and it's just gurgling like crazy. The water coming out is plenty hot enough to scald anyone who would fall or step or, or. We walk around the area and see what Mother Nature has provided for us in the way of scalding hot water and steam, volcanic gases escaping. There's a little geyser here that has gone off at times, but it looks like it's not willing to go off for us. And then back past the glory hole and on out of Mickey Hot Springs. We have to still get home tonight. And as we go on, we stop for just a moment and look at the ruins of an old stage stop on the Albert Ranch Road as we chart a course toward Bend, right at last light of the day. We've looked at several properties out in Southeast Oregon, and the one we looked at today by Coyote Lake seems to have us all satisfied that we found the right one. <laughs>